Bibles to James chapter 1. Mark is teaching in this season. Mark Jenkins has been teaching on fasting. And I thank God that he's teaching on that. <laughs> Did an excellent job again this morning. In a way, I'm teaching on fasting also, but I'm talking about fasting your mouth. So I'm going to blast you with a verse, right? I'm just going to, you know, Norval used to say all the time, he says, sometimes you just need blasting by the Holy Ghost. You know, you get stuck in a rut, you need to be blasted. Hallelujah. <laughs> well, if this verse doesn't blast you, I don't know what will. So I still hear pages turning. James chapter 1, <laughs> verse 26. We're going to do it first, then we're going to look at the whole chapter. But I want to blast you. You ready? If any man among you, and I think this applies to women also, pretty sure, pretty sure it applies to both. <laughs> if anyone among you seems to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is vain. You look up that word vain, and it means just what you was afraid it meant. Powerless, useless, having no effect whatsoever. You're dismissed. When <laughs> Surely that verse cannot mean what it says. I've been free We've been singing songs about freedom, Brother Gary. I'm free to say anything that I want. I can talk about my circumstances. I can tell you about my mountain. I am sure my mountain is worse than your mountain. He says, I can say anything I want. I can talk about myself. It's humble. I'm be just being humble. I'm weak. I'm powerless. I'm timid. I'm sick. I'm broke. But I love God. Well, I'm glad about that last part. <laughs> what about all that other, see? <laughs> you know. Now look at it again. Does it say in your Bible what it says in mine? If any man among you seems to be religious, stop right there. Go to church, sing songs, shandai along with the rest of them, use deodorant, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> learned how to not cuss in church, at least around people that go to church. I learned how to seem to be religious, you know. I mean, you know, got all the, all the earmarks. That's all good. We're not against going to church and thank God you used deodorant. We're glad of all that. But it says, if he, he can seem to be that way, but if he never learns to put a bridle, you know what a bridle is? Put a bridle on your tongue. If, if you don't ever learn to do that, your faith is going to remain pretty ineffectual. It's going to be vain. It's going to be useless. And then you wonder, where's God's power? Sure is quiet in here now. So. <laughs> For years and years, uh, you know, a lot of people, it's not just me, a lot of people, the book of James is just different from a lot of the other books. And it's almost, it seems like it jumps from topic to topic pretty fast, like Proverbs. I used to think Proverbs was like that, <clears throat> that it just two or three verses on one thing, and then two or three verses on another thing, and then two or three verses on another thing. And it took years and years of meditation where Proverbs didn't seem like that anymore to me. Well, the more you meditate James, and really, I don't think you'll ever get it just meditating James. It's as you begin assimilating the New Testament and spend a lot of time in prayer, then the book of James is not so fragmented as you first think it is. See, like most people would, let's start back now in James chapter 1, verse 1. You know, it starts off with that, that first three verses or verse, you know, first two verses that nobody has any trouble doing. Everybody, every Christian on earth can do this with ease. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. I don't have any trouble with that part. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Well, that's the easiest thing on earth. Nobody has any trouble with that. You know, all and it's all kinds of temptations. If you really look that up, it's not only temptations like, uh, you know, flat tire, washing machine broke, roof started leaking, all that kind of stuff. But 
in the context here, it's temptations to sin. All kinds of temptations, you know. Go on a fast, somebody brings you a homemade pie. <laughs> Going to fast 40 days, made it 40 minutes, you know. Was never going to watch that program again. Click. <laughs> now see, and then, so it talks about that for a minute. Then it seems like, okay, now here in the middle of this, verse, verse 5, he starts talking about wisdom. That's good. Okay, you know, if any man like wisdom. But then if you come on down here, he changes the subject again, see, in verse 10. No, verse 9, let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted but the rich. So now he's talking about that. Oh, but then he goes back to temptation again here in verse 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. Hmm. Over here it says, uh, when you fall into temptation, and there, hmm, temptation. Well, but, uh, you know, he changes the subject again down here. He starts talking about mirrors and your mouth. And then he talks about orphans and he talks about widows. And then comes back to your mouth again. <laughs> but now look at, look at how this chapter ends. Look at verse 27. Now, he started off talking about count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations. In verse 12, he says, blessed is the man that endureth temptation. In verse 27, he says, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction. Now, notice this last part. And to keep himself unspotted from the world. That's walking above temptation. Now, wait a minute. He started off talking about temptation. About the middle in verse 12, he talks about blessed is the man that endureth temptation. He talks about what causes it. But he finishes up saying, well, it is possible to walk above temptation. and Keep yourself unspotted from the world. And you know, one day the Holy Ghost said to me, and the answer to how to do that is in chapter 1. And I'm supposed to teach that to you today and for a love offering of 1995. <laughs> and I'll teach you how to do it. <laughs> Pass the buckets. No, I'm teasing. You know I'm teasing. Well, let's do look at this. But now, we have to take this in bites, okay? I think we're going to get the whole, we'll get the whole chapter in. Let's back up a little bit in the context here. Pure religion and undefiled before you, before God the, and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows and their infliction. And to keep himself unspotted from the world. Now that part right there is really keep himself unspotted from the world. That's really what this chapter is about. The whole chapter. How do you do that? Well, the last time we spoke, let's back up a little bit here to verse 21. Now he's still talking. In this whole chapter, he's talking about temptation. Before it's over, we're going to get the whole chapter in. But in the context right here, let's, let's start in verse 21. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. It's a little King Jamesy. We'll come back to that. And receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your what? And James did not use that word by accident. He's not talking about the saving of your spirit. You got born again the day you received Jesus. You can, th th this letter is written to born again people. He's not talking about that. Listen, your spirit cannot get more saved than it did the day you received Jesus Christ. You, you went from death to life. The, the picture for me is from the Old Testament. The day, you know, if you've seen Cecil B. DeMille's uh, The Ten Commandments, and you saw the Red Sea parted there, and Israel went across on dry ground, and they're on the other side, and then the sea closes up on Pharaoh. And they are not in Egypt anymore. That's what happened to you the day you got born again. He delivered you from the kingdom of darkness and delivered you over into the kingdom of light. You went from a son of Adam to a son of God. And you have been born again. But let's go on with that picture a little bit more. They were over there all right. God had them out of Egypt. But they still had a lot of Egypt in them. And if you'll notice there whining and complaining and did you just bring us out here to die and there's no water and oh for the leeks of Egypt leeks are onions they liked onions and garlic you know? <laughs> they, 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 they were desiring the things and there was one point they even said we'd been better off to die as slaves 
in Egypt. Well, what, what in the world is going on there? Well, they still had a lot of Egypt in them. He delivered. That's, and that's a perfect picture. That's exactly what happens. We get born again. And I mean born again. You are not in that kingdom of darkness anymore. You are no longer a son of Adam. You are a son of the living God. Jesus, the second man, the last Adam, has become your progenitor. And you are a child of the living God. However, in that soul arena, here it talks about the saving of your soul. In that soul arena, there's a lot of Egypt. I happened to be 33 years old before I really got born again. One day, one day the Holy Spirit, I said, God, why am I having so much trouble? You know, this was a long time after that date. I was 33, and let's say 10 years down the road, I was still struggling with stuff. I said, God, I can't believe that I'm still as messed up as I am. How come I'm that way? And he says, well, you were trained by a sin nature and a fallen world for 33 years. It's a major project to renew the mind. Romans 12, 1 and 2. We be not no longer conformed to this world, but that we be transformed by the renewing of your spirit, by the renewing of your mind. And that's, the soul encompasses the mind, the intellect, the will, the emotions, and that's where most of the strongholds are. All different kinds of strongholds. You got hurt somehow. You got hurt more than one way. You know, we got all kinds of emotional things there. We build all kinds of walls around ourselves. Those are all in the realm of the soul. We call them strongholds. We don't even know why we do what we do sometimes. Like that man in Romans 7. I don't want to do it. I'm never going to do that again. And then you wind up doing it. And we don't even know why. And commercial break for tongues. That's the genius of God right there. You don't, we don't know why we are the way we are. We don't know even what the strongholds are. So he gave us this language that bypasses our intellect. We don't even have to know what's wrong with us. We don't know, have to know why. The Holy Ghost does know why. And if you allow him to make that intercession for you, which is according to the perfect will of God, he'll eventually bring you right up to your stronghold. You and the Holy Ghost will stand there like Joshua looking at Jericho and the angel of the Lord saying, I mean, here's this stronghold that's massive and that's fortified and the gates are shut up and they're ready for war. And the Holy Ghost will say the same thing to you that he said to Joshua. See, I've given that stronghold into your hand. And you're going, bet me? <laughs> that thing's been defeating me my whole life, you know. Whatever it is, you know. He says, I've given it into your hand. Go up, let's go up at once to possess it. And going, what? <laughs> well, that's what we call an impasse. But the same Holy Ghost that brought you where you can see it is the same Holy Ghost that will bring you to the place where it will be destroyed. And you will occupy land in your soul you never thought you could occupy. Freedom like you never thought you had. And boy, you wish that was the only stronghold in the land. <laughs> he says, look up on that ridge. What's that? That's AI. Oh, God. Anyway. <laughs> but it's stronghold by stronghold you possess the land. Okay? All right? Well, here in verse 21 where it says, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness. That's pretty easy. That superfluity of naughtiness. Now, if you look that up, the Greek word there for superfluity, it means the superabundance. It's like if you had a glass, not only full, but it's overflowing. It's that overflowing part. <laughs> it's, it's more than full. It's, it's a superabundance. And naughtiness simply means wickedness. The best translation I ever heard of that phrase right there is the residue of wickedness carried over from your old life. It would be like the Egypt that is remaining in your soul. It is like the remaining parts in you that still think like the old man, still motivated by that old man. Even though the old man is dead, your soul did not get born again. Your spirit got born again. Your spirit is already perfectly righteous. You can't make it more righteous. It is righteous and holy from the get-go, but the soul has to be renewed. It has to be to think like God. Right there's a place for me to introduce why this wisdom. Why, why does he start talking about wisdom? Let's back up now to chapter, at verse 1 of chapter 1. Starting in verse 2, really. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Now, for today's subject, we're not going to talk about car wrecks and that kind of thing so much, although that would be included. Today, we're going to talk about sin. Is that plain enough for you? Sin, 
And I, it could be all, you know, some men's sins are obvious. You know, Sue and I come in here smoking like a freight train. We couldn't even make it through a 30-minute worship service. We'd, we'd sneak, now at least we had enough sense not to, you know, not to brag about it. We'd sneak down over the hill, sneak down where you couldn't see us, and we'd have a smoke, and we'd come walking back, and all the way back, she's got the Febreze bottle out. Pachoo, pachoo, pachoo. You know, she's, my, I'd come in, my ears would be dripping Febreze. But, you know, and I said, honey, they can still smell it. I don't care. Pachoo, pachoo, pachoo. You know? But, but thank God we kept coming. You know? I mean, they, and Dave saved our lives. He said, listen, God will walk through hell with you with your strongholds. As long as you're not justifying them and as long as you continue to do those things that will one day spell out your freedom, he'll walk through hell with you. Thank God he kept saying that because I kept coming back. And even, now, even though every now and then, bless his heart, he'd do a real strong message on smokers. Now, I'd always scrunch it down a little bit, but he, he did it in love, you know, but still he says, now smoking won't take you to hell. It'll just make you feel like, you, you know, make you smell like you've been there. Pachoo, pachoo. Anyway. <laughs> So let's talk about sin, whatever it is. It could be, now that's, I'm trying to be transparent. It could be anything. External things like smoking, overeating, uh, pornography, internet fingers, whatever. On and on and on. Stealing, um, you know. Or it could be all kinds of internal sins. Jealousy, envy, anger, gossip, hatred, malice, on and on. All. But anyway... In any event, all of those things are sin. We're talking about that. Temptation, okay? Sin. So he says, well, count it all joy when you fall into divers' temptations. What? Knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience. And that word patience there is better translated endurance. The American version of patience Somebody gave us a picture one time, and it showed this basset hound dog that had a bunch of puppies. And the basset hound is just sitting there like the mother, you know, and it's got all of her puppies. And the puppies are all pulling and biting on her ears. And she's just taking it. <laughs> See? That's what we think patience is. That's not, that may be patience. This word here is endurance. The picture painted would be like a warrior, a single warrior with his sword drawn, slaying the enemy... And there's 300 behind that one. But one by one, he's not going to stop till every single enemy is destroyed. That is endurance. Let endurance have its perfect work. Hmm. Now, that's verse 4. But let endurance have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting, and that means lacking nothing. How many would like that? Okay, now, if it, why in the world then does he start talking about wisdom then? He has not changed the subject. Well, I don't know how to do that, Brother James. I mean, when I get tempted, trust me, it's not joyful. It's war. He said, well, you don't, the problem is you don't know how to, how to overcome. You don't know what to do. You need God's wisdom. That's why he's bringing this in at this point. You need God's wisdom. Now, if any man lack wisdom... Wisdom on what? How to endure when you're tempted. How to overcome. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God that gives to all men. And that's important. All men liberally. We're going to come back, hopefully. Okay. There is individual wisdom for your walk. There is individual leadership, depending on your calling. He would have phrased it differently. What he's talking about here is the wisdom that has, all come, that has come from God for all men. Hey, everything in this book is yours. When it comes to healing, when it comes to being victorious over sin, when it comes to all of those things, we're all the same, my brothers and sisters. You're not tempted worse than somebody else. You have victory like I have victory, like Dave has victory, and you're going to have to overcome it like everybody else overcomes it. I have a good friend who's a prophet. It's scary how he can hear God for me. <laughs> and he can. This is a real one, not a made-up one. But I found over the years, he has to, when it comes to his own walk from God, he has not a whit advantage over me just because he's a prophet. He has to fast and pray and seek God the same way I have to fast and pray and seek God. 
We're all in that same boat, is what I'm saying. So when he says, if, if any man lack, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that gives to all men liberally and upbraideth not, it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. God, that is going to mean so much to you in just a few minutes. I should take another offering right now. <laughs> let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. Why can't I overcome God? Why is it that I keep falling to this same thing? Hmm. God's going to give you his answer. Now here's the, what, the kind I'm talking about today. This answer is already in the book. He'll lead you to where it is. And when he shows you, your, your tendency is not going to be to believe it. You say, well, that's true for Daisy. But I don't know if that's true for me. Well, the same blood that set Daisy free is the same blood that set you free. She didn't receive a different new nature than you receive. Hmm. For let him ask in faith nothing wavering, for he that wavers is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. Boy, he brings that up. Can you see that driven with the wind and tossed while we're on that subject? Come over to chapter 3. This will show you also, he doesn't change the subject all the way through chapter 3. We just looked a while ago, unless you bridle your tongue, in chapter 1, unless you bridle your tongue. Watch this in chapter 3. Look at verse 3. Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouth. What? Over in chapter 1, he says, unless you bridle your tongue. A bridle is a bit. We put, well, a, a bit is part of a bridle. It's the part that literally goes on the tongue. We, now notice, we put bits in the horse's mouths that they may obey us and we turn about their whole body. Why? We have to bridle the tongue. You want to change the direction of the horse? You have to put that bridle on its tongue. You want to change the direction of your life? You're going to have to bridle your tongue. And if you don't, your religion is going to wind up being useless. Power in the tongue, my people. Power, there is power in the tongue. Okay? Here, over here in chapter 1, he says, Yet it is driven by fierce winds. Look at verse 6 here. He says, Let him ask in faith nothing wavering, for he that wavers is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Over in chapter 3, three verse 3, Behold also, the, excuse me, verse 4, Behold also the ships, which though they be so great, and are driven of what? Fierce winds. He's not changed the subject. He's talking about the same thing. Yet they are turned about with a very small hem, whithersoever the governor lists, whichever way you want to go. Well, what is the rudder? Even so, the tongue. Now, when, you, when this parable, he says a great ship. We're not talking about a canoe here. I want you to picture the Titanic. Picture the Queen Mary, something that size. What that represents is your life. It represents the course of your life. Which way are you going? Maybe the way you're going is not the way you really want to go. See, you're getting a lot of help. Those fierce winds, that's the way of the world. That's the pressure of the enemy. That is the devil trying to help you along any path but God's. You're being driven of fierce winds. Sometimes it's economic. Sometimes it's family. Sometimes it's physical. There's all the external things that the devil can do. That's the arsenal that he has. He doesn't have a lot of supernatural things like they want you to believe. He's been limited to the things of the earth. That's what anyway, Davis taught us eloquently on that. But he puts all these things, Mark chapter 4 type things, persecution, affliction, the cares of this world. And if that doesn't move you, then he starts enticing you with the shiny things, you know, the lust of other things and wanting to have better things all the time. Anything to get you going, he's driving you with fierce winds in a direction he wants you to go. And you'll go that way unless you ever learn to bridle your tongue. Change the rudder on that ship of yours. And now notice, i got to do this demonstration. I did it Sunday night. I'm going to do it again because it's important. Now notice, verse 4 again. Behold also the ships which though they be so great. Now, he's not talking about a canoe. It's a big ship. It represents your whole life. It could represent your ministry, which are driven of fierce winds, fierce. 
yet they are turned right while the storm is going on, yet they are turned with a very small helm. Whichever way that the governor wants to go, that's you. Whichever way you decide to go. Well, how do you do it? Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. So I like this demonstration. Picture me as being the Queen Mary. All right? Now, let's say that I heard this Gary Carpenter message, and I went home and I said, I am going to put a bridle on my mouth. Let, let's just say it was something physical. We, we could pick anything. It could be finances. It could be anything. But let's just say maybe I've been having health problems. Okay, and they're serious. And I've been going in this direction that I don't want to go. I mean, up ahead of me is death. But, you know, it's depending on how, how bad the health problem is. And let's say right here, this is like time. And going this direction, it's getting worse. But I heard that Gary Carpenter message today. I said, I am going to bridle my tongue. I'm not going to say anything other than what the Bible says. Today, by his stripes, I was healed. And I, go, I get my old confessions from years ago out and blow the dust off of him, and I start saying him again. He blesses my bread. He blesses my water. My God takes sickness away from the midst of me. By his stripes I was healed. And from this day forward, I'm not saying anything different. But notice, the Queen Mary has been going this way for a long ways. Honey, you don't turn. You change the realm. Realm. You change the helm. You change the rudder right at this point. And at this point, I don't say anything different. But notice, I've got momentum. That ship is, now it's turning, see me turning? It's turning, but I'm further, it's worse than where I started if this direction represents worse. Now, by his stripes I was healed. He blesses my bread. He blesses my water. He takes sickness away from the midst of me. I'm saying all the confessions, and I finally get my ship turned around the right direction. Right here, people come to me with counseling. I want counseling. I need counseling bad, Brother Gary. What's wrong? I've been doing what you said. What happened? It's worse. Well, of course it's worse. I'm further this way than where I started, even though my confession has been perfect. You don't change. That's why he used the illustration of the Queen Mary. This is not a canoe that you can go, whoop. By the time you get that, now what's really happening in there, this is a nice picture, but what's really happening is you are getting God's word in your heart in abundance. This is in the faith is coming stage. Up until then, you were educated for 33 years or however long it was by a sin nature and and, and a fallen world to believe what you feel, to believe what you see, to believe the doctor's reports, to believe all of that. That was truth to you. But what you've been doing now, God's wisdom has come. You have put a bridle on your tongue. You're going to change the course of your life. You've put his word in your mouth like a bit. You're not saying anything different. Faith is coming. Faith is coming. Faith is coming. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You finally got that thing turned around. And when you start speaking now, you start having power come out. And by golly, you're going upstream against everything that the world says, everything that natural wisdom says. You're operating by the wisdom that comes from another realm. One day you'll get back to where you started, but if you don't quit, you will go beyond there. And one of, your, one of these days, your deliverance is manifested. Now, I use that example on healing. The same would be true on anything. It would be the true on smoking. It would be true on whatever stronghold it is. That's been dogging you all these years. Now, fasting helps. Get Mark's message. He talked about fasting the body. I'm talking about fasting your mouth. Putting a bridle on your lips. Bridling the tongue. Hmm. Well, he talks about this wisdom here. Let's go back to chapter 1 of James. Let him, the verse, uh, verse 5. If any, if, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. That gives to all men liberally and upbraids not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavers is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Now, in context, I'm having to give this to you in bits. You know what the wavering is there? If I, the wavering is being a... The, later on, he talks about the man that speaks... Double-minded. He speaks out of the same mouth. He blesses God and curses men. Wavering is when I'm going to go make my confessions in my prayer closet. 
But when I come out, I'm still going to talk like I have all these problems. That's wavering. I'm healed. How do you feel? Oh, I'm so sick. What? <laughs> if, you, if you're still in the wavering stage, you're going to continue to be tossed. You have not really set the rudder. Your, your rudder is like going all over the place. I'm healed. Nope, I'm sick. Uh, I'm, I feel better today. I don't feel better today. <laughs> Jesus loves me. It works on anything. He loves me. I'm not so sure he loves me today. I felt like he loved me yesterday. And your rudder's flip-flopping all over the place. You're not operating by God's wisdom. Now, I want to get this real clear. When it, come, when it says wisdom, what he's, what, in the context, what he's saying is, what does God say? Wisdom that comes from God is in his word. Now you're saying what you're saying based on temporal evidence. How you feel, what you see, what you're hearing, what somebody else is saying, the doctor's report, and, I, and I'm, hey, I thank God for doctors that keep us alive till faith comes. <laughs> I pray and thank God for my, my healing while I take the aspirin and thank him for the aspirin. Glory to God. Okay? But this is the wisdom that's from another realm. What does God say? Now, I want, to, I want to read a little bit more before I get into this now. The reason he has this rich in here, verse 10 and 11. Uh, let me back up. I'm trying to get a seminar in one service. <laughs> Let's do six again, so calm down, Gary. Let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. If you mark in your Bible or if you're taking notes, that is specifically talking about your tongue. How you waver is by what you're saying. And I mean what you're saying all the time, not just when you're around us. Not when you're just around people that know the truth. He that wavers is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Now, that is, did you? Did the Lord pay with his own stripes for your healing? If you don't bridle your tongue, you're never going to receive it. Is that plain enough for you? Let not that man think. What man? The man that wavers. The man that will not receive God's wisdom. The man that will not say what God says. Say it another way. If it wasn't healing. I've been struggling with my... Let's take someone with... Uh, I'm going to use me in a minute with nicotine addiction. Let's, I'll save that one. So, someone that's, that's always had an addiction to pornography. There's a reason why you have that addiction. I'm not going to get into it. could be different with different people. Chemicals are released. There's a pleasure factor involved. Okay? And you say, now there's scriptures you can find. There's God's wisdom for that. Some of them would be the same ones I'm going to do here in a little bit. If you say about you what God says about you, and then do all the rest of the message, you set your tongue like the rudder on the ship and you only say about you what God says about you as one of the tools that you have the day will come you won't have to resist pornography anymore pornography will not be a temptation to you that stronghold will be gone do y'all know t what is this what year is this 2012 I've been uh, this year 32 years without a drink of alcohol of any kind 32 years I think I'm free <laughs> That, and I mean, no, it's not a temptation. It's not something I battle. It's been over. Just so you know, today is my mother's 91st birthday. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. The reason I'm mentioning that, that's, I happened to quit smoking on her birthday. And today's nine years of that. Nine years. Some of you goes, well, boy, he was smoking a long time. I told you I was. Anyway. And it's not a temptation anymore. I don't have to battle it anymore. It's not a fight anymore. I can't, um, to me, it'd be like licking an ashtray. I, there's no, nothing, the stronghold is gone. I'm going to get to part of, part of the answer for that here in a little bit. And I wave, I didn't understand this all then. And I wavered. I wavered all the time. I look back at it now and I go, well, how did I ever get free? We'll talk about grace later. <laughs> He helped me. He helped me with a vision. Anyway, 
So verse 7, let, the, let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. Because a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Oh, if in the context here, you'll see it so clear in a minute. A what does he mean a double-minded man? I hear what God says, but I look at how I am. I see what God says, but I see also how I am. Uh, the word says this about me, but I act this way about me. I, God says this, but I see that. I'm not sure who I am. Why is God not answering my prayer? <laughs> I'm free, I'm sick, I'm free, I'm sick. I'm free, I'm, I'm, I'm addicted, I'm free, I'm addicted. Unstable, double-minded. Now, the reason for 9, 10, and 11 uh, uh, about the rich man, we'll get into that in, in another time. For this part, let's read it. Let's keep it in here. Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withers the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. Now, he goes right back after that to blessed is the man that endureth temptation. What is that in there for? Listen, this wisdom from God, he makes no distinction based upon your wealth. You can be a man in the gutter. You can be a man in the palace. When you get born again, each is just as free. It doesn't matter whether you're educated. It doesn't matter whether you're not educated. It doesn't matter whether you're anything about any of your external things of your life. God's wisdom applies to all. And you can all be free. Especially in this area of temptation. So let's get back into it. Now he goes verse 12. Back talking about temptation. Which he's been talking about the answer the whole time. We'll see it here. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried. He shall receive the crown of life. Which the Lord has promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted. I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither tempts he any man. I've heard that in my Christian life, in my 30 some odd years. I've had people actually say to me, well, God put that temptation there to see if I could withstand it. Well, no, he didn't. God, now you can read where it said God tempted Abraham. That bothered me a lot for years until I finally got it. This says, God doesn't tempt any man with evil. If you don't think God ever tries you and tests you to see if you'll obey him, you haven't been around here very long. You haven't prayed very long. Because he will. He'll say, uh, I'm not going to. I was so glad to be free of the legal. And I shouldn't bring this out right here. I'll run people off again. Let's say it this way. I was so glad to find out I was no longer under the law of Moses. Because under the law of Moses, you know, you didn't have a choice. 10% belonged to God and 90% was yours. So then, you know, we start hearing this wonderful messages by Dave Roberson. Began praying a lot in other tongues and meditating the whole word and, and uh, assimilating the word and everything. And God began dealing with me about being his steward. About being his steward of finances. And so one day, Sue and I come into church, minding our own business. Everything was just fine. And God, there's, we, at that time, we had a particular lady who was part of the worship team. And God pointed her out to us. Now, we knew in the natural there was some, some financial trouble going on. We didn't know to what degree. But while the worship was going on, God just said to us plainly, He says, and at the end of the service, I want you to go over and write her out a blank check, sign it. Tell her to go home and add up all of her bills and fill in the amount and put that in the bank and pay her bills. <clears throat> I wanted so quickly to go back under the law. <laughs> and especially when I heard what's coming. You, you have... So anyway, at the, end of, at, the, at the end of the service, we did exactly that. And I went, we went and talked to her, did it privately, you know, trying not to let the left hand know what the right hand's doing, weren't doing it for any ulterior motive. And she was... You know, we said, now, here's a, here, a signed blank check. You know, it wasn't blank. It, I mean, it had her name in it, but the amount was missing. And I says, now, our instruction, take this home, 
add up all, whatever you're behind on. Now, don't go out and have a shopping spree. <laughs> but whatever you're behind on, you know, f- then fill in that amount here and put it in the bank when the bank's open and then pay your bills. We're walking away from her and she said, well, is there any limit? I hadn't even thought of that myself. I said, well, God, you know, on the inside, God, is there? And Sue and I were not walking in super abundance of finances, okay? But the ministry had some. We had, you know, we had some. And I heard these words come out of my mouth. I heard them when she heard them. Keep it under $5,000. Now, you, you, you try and look like you're all full of faith and power and wisdom and peace. Peace. Yeah, just keep it under 5000 On the inside, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. I don't even know if we have $5,000. If we... If we Bring in every resource of Gary Carpenter Ministries International. I'm not sure if we have $5,000. But see, he always knows. Sure enough. Now, and again, it's been so many years now, my memory's not quite perfect on this anymore. If you hear an earlier tape on this, that tape is right. (laughs) But the essence is correct here. If I remember right, it was real close. It was like maybe $4,800, $4,900. It was real close to that $5,000. And we had about 5,200 in the bank. Now see, freedom is not always what you think it's going to be. That, you think that was not God finding out if we would obey him? I was talking, you know, you think God won't put you, it's not really a test from God. It's like, well, can I trust you to do this? Remember in the parable of the unjust steward, it says, he that's found faithful in little will be faithful in much. Well, he'll find out. Will you be faithful at this level? Are you faithful at the 5,000 level? If you are, then I know I can trust you with more. See? Well, anyway, verse 12. Blessed is the man that endures temptation. But now the temptation here we're talking about is sin primarily. For when he is tried and, re- and, and endures it, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I'm tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil. God is never going to tempt you to commit. He's never going to dangle a prostitute in front of you with the idea, let's see if you can resist that. Okay? I could pick what things from the women. Do you all get the drift? All right? Neither tempts he any man with evil. God doesn't do that. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust. Now... I don't know how you got to remember this, but remember this. That lust is not in your spirit. There is no lust in the reborn again you. We could go back to Ephesians right now and talk about put on the new man, which is, is created. You could put from the get-go in righteousness and true holiness. There's nothing in your spirit that lusts after sin. That is that residue of wickedness. That is Egypt carried over in the soul. It's part of the flesh. Yeah, there's a natural high that comes from endorphins and all of the chemicals that are produced. And there's also ego highs when a man conquers, you know, and he, in his mind, he's, he's like slept with that pretty woman. So now he's worth something. See, there's those kind of things. But all of that exists in the soul realm. That's why here a little later on, he talks about to the saving of your soul. That lust here, he says, when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed, that lust is not in your spirit. You've got to get that part clear. That's not you. That strongholds in the land. That can be defeated, every single one of them, not just defeated, but removed. Hmm. But without that, if you don't have this wisdom and you don't know what to do, then lust, when lust hath conceived... You thought about it, you thought about it, you meditated on it. You know, people say, I don't know what happened. I was walking along in life and I woke up and I I just committed adultery somehow. No, you didn't. You did not. Lust had to be conceived. There had to be time and thought and thinking about it and thinking about it. and Maybe resisting it, but still thinking about it. (laughs) And And then finally it conceives. And when that happens, then it's like a baby. It brings forth sin. You know, man and woman have to conceive. Has, that baby has to be conceived and then eventually it's brought forth. It's the same way. But that all happens in the arena of the soul. I am glad I go to this church. I, am, I always thought there was something wrong with me. There's really nothing wrong with the real you. That's why God can answer your prayers. That was free right there. You ought to, 
That was free right there. <laughs> your righteousness is not based on that soul. Your righteousness is based on your spirit. Now, don't get crazy with that and go off and separate the two. And, okay, I can live any way I want to. We got more services than this one. You need to hear more than this one. I can only touch on one part today. Okay. No, you can't either. <laughs> He's answered some of my prayers when in my, in my soul realm at the time. A Christian, born again, tongue talker, looked fine when I came to church with you. But in my, at home, I felt like the lowest, slimiest. And I'd pray, and he'd answer. And I'm like, How in the world? Could you answer a prayer for somebody like me? He said, I, he says, the somebody I answered is not who you think you are. Hmm. That's good right there too. Anyway. <laughs> All right. So verse 15, then when, when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin and sin when it's finished, boy, you got this right, brings forth death. That's why Dave always says, you know, the devil, he doesn't always try and get you to commit the big thing first, just a little sin, just a little sin. He says, you know, every, every baby, anything is cute. You know, the little baby crocodile's cute. But the devil doesn't intend for that crocodile staying a baby. That thing's going to grow up and bite your head clean off, you know. <laughs> it's, it's, sin isn't out to hurt you. Sin's out to kill you. See? So do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good and every perfect gift is from above. And cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Now notice, of his own will begat he us with what? With what? The word of truth. That, if you, if you underline or do anything in your Bible, you could underline word of truth. And over here in verse 6, where it says, let him, no, excuse me, verse 5, where it says, if any of you lack wisdom, that wisdom is in the word of truth of truth. The same thing that got you born again, the word of truth. That same wisdom of God is there, the word of truth, to bring you his wisdom to get you set free from any temptation you're struggling with and not only get you free but destroy the stronghold itself. And it's in the word of truth. Of his own will he begat us with the word of truth that we should be kind of a, a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Do you know that everything you see is going to be destroyed? The whole earth, the heavens, the skies, everything, the constellations, everything is going to be destroyed with a loud noise and a fervent heat. And there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, but there will not be a new you. Not if you're born again. You are the first fruits of that future creation already walking this planet. Glory to God. You're the first fruits of that new creation that's coming. But the same born again you is going to walk on that world that's walking on this one now. <laughs> Glory to God. Who are you, you giant? Child of the Almighty God, servant of the Most High. Hmm. Of, his own, of his own will begat us with the word of truth that we should be kind of a first fruit of his creatures. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, we can't, we can't talk. Well, I'd love to go, do a whole service right here, but that'll be another service. Let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. For the wrath of man works not the righteousness of God. Now, all of that leading up to where I started a while ago. Wherefore? Based on all of that. It's like he already gave you the answer. Lay apart. Well, wait a minute. Up here you said to endure temptation. And if you didn't know how, ask for wisdom. Well, what would that wisdom be? That would be the word of truth. Well, how would I get that to operate in my life? Let's keep reading, shall we? <laughs> so verse 20, I want to keep it all in the flow. we got time. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. Now, now that I've said all that before, let's say this a little different. He's not kidding. If we learn how to operate in this wisdom that he's talking about in this chapter, it is possible for you, dear heart, to literally lay aside and never pick up again filthiness or any of the strongholds that you've carried over from the land of Egypt. It's possible to walk free of all of that if you learn how to operate in this wisdom. Part of it, you're going to have to receive with meekness 
the engrafted word. That word engrafted could be better translated planted. Jesus, when asked him about faith, he said, faith, first the blade. It's like a, it's like a farmer that it goes and he plants the seed. And in it, you know, it's a daylight and night. He rises and sleeps and the seed springs up and grows. And he doesn't really know how it works. But it's first the blade, then the ear, then the full corn on, in the ear. Here he's saying, you've got to receive the word and plant it in you. It's got to become a harvest. You, if you may, again, it's like the Queen Mary. You may not see that corn grow. You, know, you don't plant the corn one day and go harvest it the next day. There is a growth and a maturing process. you got to learn to receive with meekness. Meekness means teachability. Can you still be taught by God? Are you willing to say, God, whatever you say about me is the truth no matter how I seem. No matter what I act like. I am teachable. You tell me who you say I am. The I am says what you am. <laughs> really? That's funny in English, but if the great I am, really, his word makes you what you am. If you can receive the engrafted word and be taught by him. But you say, what we do is, you say I'm, you say I'm free from sin. My experience tells me <laughs> I'm not quite as free as you say I am. And then God would say, well... Who's telling the truth here? Are you the great I am? Or am I the great I am? I am says this about you. Now what are you going to say about you? Well, if you, if you become meek, that means you're teachable. You're willing to receive his word planted in you. So you'll reap a different harvest. It is able to save your souls. He's really talking about renewing the mind. And more than just the mind. All of the encompassing the emotional realm. Tearing down strongholds realm. Where you literally, it's the metamorphosis process. Where you go from whatever you think you are now. Like that caterpillar. Which describes a lot of the way. I, anyway, like that caterpillar. But you're going to emerge as that butterfly. You're going to emerge different than what you've seen in the past. Okay? And in verse 22, why in the world do you put that right here? Be you doers of the word. What word? What word? What he said about your stronghold. What his word of truth says about you. Be you doers of that and not a hearer only. Deceiving your own selves. And I said last time, I'll say it again. If, you don't, if you're not willing to start doing what, the, what I'm teaching here today, what James is really, I was, I'm just plagiarizing James. If you're not willing to do what he says here, you don't need the devil to deceive you. You'll keep deceiving your own self. Well, I know the Bible says by his stripes I was healed, but oh... Or I know the Bible says I'm, I'm free from sin, but going to that X, triple X rated movie anyway. Or like Mark said this morning, you know, I, I know the Bible says do not lie, but it seems to me lying would be better for me this time. <laughs> you do it anyway. You're deceiving your own self. So here you get, he gets real specific here. Verse 23. If any man be a hearer of the word, what word? The word of truth. And not a doer, he's like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. Yeah, and you could say a mirror. We'd say a mirror today. He, he looks at himself. He beholds himself. Yep. And then goes his way. And then straightway forgets what manner of man that he was. Now, see, we'd think in the natural, that'd be really stupid. I told you one day on my, I think it was about my 45th birthday, I woke up one morning. You know how you're rubbing the sleep out of your eyes? And look in the mirror. You go, Dad? <laughs> Then I had my 65th birthday the other day, rubbing my eyes, looked in the mirror. Grandpa? <laughs> but now see, you can look in the, wouldn't this be stupid for me to look in the natural mirror, see who I am? Okay, this is Gary, okay. And then when I leave there, forget totally what I saw, 
and say, well, I'm a blue-eyed blonde about 35 years old, and I'm going to get me a motorcycle and skin-tight rubber suit, and I'm going to go after chasing me some women. You know. You say, what's wrong with you? You don't even know who you are. That's what church people do all the time. We'll come and listen to Dave take us down the born-again trail. Or we'll come listen to that series on Ephesians. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You put off that old man, put on the new man, which is created from the get-go in righteousness and true holiness. You're not a son of Adam anymore. You're a child of the living God in that new nature. You can put your foot right on the neck of sin. And you go, yeah, that's who I am. That's who I am. Till you get out into the, oh, and we say, oh, yeah, and love your enemies. Yeah, that's me. I love my enemies. And you go out there and somebody keyed your car. Let the air out of two tires. It's sitting like this. And you go, let me at them. Oh, my, how, I have lawyers who have lawyers. They'll rue the day. You forgot what manner of man you are. Or you get back home and internet, the internet is there. You've done it before. The temptation comes. Lust conceives. Fingers touch. And forgot who you are. That's why he says here. Verse 24, he beholds himself, goes his way, and straightway forgets what manner of man he was. But whoso looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues therein, and continues. Jesus said, he didn't just say, you shall know, he did say that you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. But the verse before that says, if you continue in my word, not hear it once, if you continue in my word, you shall be my disciple indeed. Then he says, you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. He's saying the same thing here. Whoso looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues therein. You don't forget who you are. Not uh, Being not a forgetful here, but a doer of the work. What work is he talking about? He's talking about transforming, saving your soul work. This man shall be blessed in his deed. And here's the verse we started with. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, he deceives his own heart. This man's religion is vain. It's useless. It's powerless. It will never accomplish the change. So he's talking about put a bridle on your tongue. You ask for wisdom. How do I get free of this stronghold? What does my word of truth say? I'm asking for wisdom. What does my word of truth say? Now, to bring this home, I'm going to use my example again. I'm blowing the dust. This is the very confessions that I made back in the ugly building. Way back, way back there. When, when uh, I was struggling with nicotine. And I could not get free. I had been smoking for 40 some odd years. And I had tried everything. I tried patches. I tried gum. I tried everything in the world. And I just couldn't get free. I... You know, even after 40 years, even you start thinking you're not going to be free. And Dave would loving, I'd get so condemned, you know, and, and, and thank God again for Dave saying over and over that God loves you. He'll walk through hell with you and your strongholds. Just keep praying. Keep, keep doing the things that will eventually spell out your freedom. Well, in my case, I would come to Romans 6. Go to Romans 6 just for a minute so you can see how we do this. And again, now get the picture. I'm just puffing away. That Shekinah glory, that, that cloud that was following me around was not the Shekinah glory cloud. Okay, that was, man. And I'm using this one because it's easy to illustrate it. But this, thing, this same principle applies. I don't care what your temptation is. I don't care what it is. Okay. Well, it's verse 6. I mean, here I'm just puffing away. By all evidence, I am not free. And it starts off. What shall we say then? Puff, puff. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And I'm going, I'm not really sure. Puff, puff. God forbid. Oh, I guess we're not supposed to. How shall we, puff, puff, that are dead to sin, puff, puff, live any longer therein? And I'm going, I don't know. Know you not that so many of us, as we're baptized into Jesus Christ, we're baptized into his death? And I remember saying out loud one time, I said, I guess I don't know. I guess I don't know it. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. And this goes on and on. Now look, especially the verses that would get me. 
Verse 12. Look at this. I'm puffing away. I know it's sin. Tried everything in the world to get free. Get free for a little while, come back smoking worse than ever. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. And there's no, no denying I was. I was obeying my body in the lust thereof. Every time I'd try and quit, my body would turn on me. <laughs> it says, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> you're going you're to die. Uh, you know, bless her heart. One of my daughters, one time, I, I, I was going to quit smoking. I made it a few days. I don't remember now, four, five, six days. On the sixth, whatever day it was, she went to the, she went to the quick trip and bought me a pack of cigarettes. Come back and gave it to me. And says, she says, quit some other time. None of us can live with you anymore. Please. Like Dave that time was going to go on another long fast in the early days, you know, and you're, go you're getting purged. Rosalie said, oh, you're going on another long fast? Would you mind to fast somewhere else? <laughs> well, I had done it. I felt so condemned and powerless, and I tried everything. I tried the will worship thing, you know, trying to do it through strength of willpower. Nothing worked. And finally, I started understanding this wisdom from God. That unless I put a bit in my mouth and began to say God's wisdom, God's wisdom is what God says. What does I am say about Gary? So I took this very chapter, I took most of these verses, not every single one, but most of these verses, and I made them into a positive, present tense, now confession. And I remember walking the field out there just smoking away. I didn't know what else to do. I was, I mean, it's not like I could, I would have quit if I could have quit. You get that? Now, I know now I could have, but I didn't know it then. I tried, and all the evidence, y'all remember the day I was walking out there, I told you this a lot of times. It says right in here, it says, let not, it says, verse 14, sin shall not have dominion over you. And I'd go, I don't have any evidence that that's true except your word. And immediately I heard it. And that's all the evidence you need. But I didn't understand this so well then. Eh? Now, here is what I began to do. And I did it for a long time. Listen, the renewing of... Remember, you don't change the Queen Mary on a dime. You don't turn the course of that thing. James said, you've got to take the rudder of your ship, which is your tongue. You've got to find God's wisdom. You want to know what, what to do? Find what the I am says about you or about that case. Find what he says. Take that and put it like a bit in the horse's mouth or like changing the rudder on your ship. And don't say anything except what the I am says about you. So I began to do that very thing. And I'm just smoking away. I'm just puffing away. In fact... Would y'all, now all, everything I'm about to say is scripture. Would y'all mind to repeat it with me? I think it'd do you good. Now, for example, I don't want you saying something you don't want to say. So, like in verse 2 here, it says, God forbid, how, how, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Well, all I put was Romans 6, 2, I am dead to sin. And it's going to be like that all the way through this. All right, so, say after me. I am dead to sin. I have been baptized into the death of Jesus Christ. I am buried with him by baptism into death. As Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, I now walk in newness of life. I have been planted together with him in the likeness of his death. I shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. My old man is crucified with him. That the body of sin be destroyed. Henceforth I do not serve sin. My body is dead. And I am free from sin. I am dead with Christ, 
but I also live with him. I know that Christ is raised from the dead. And he dies no more. Death has no dominion over him. He died unto sin once. He lives now unto God. I also am dead indeed unto sin. I am alive unto God. Through Jesus Christ my Lord. I do not let sin reign in my mortal body. I do not obey my body in the lust thereof. I am alive from the dead. My body is an instrument of righteousness. Sin has no dominion over me. I am not under law, but under grace. I am God's servant. I yield myself to God in obedience unto righteousness. I am free from sin. I am a servant of righteousness. I present my body unto God as a servant to righteousness unto holiness. I am free from sin. I am God's servant. My fruit is holiness and everlasting life. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ my Lord. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now I borrowed that one from Romans 8, but I had to have it. Hallelujah. <laughs> now that's how you do it. That's the wisdom. That's, that's the very thing that James is talking about in chapter 1. He says you've got to take God's word, that word of truth, the same word that begat you. You ask God for his wisdom. Well, let me find out what God says. What does he say? He says all that about me. He says I'm free. He says I'm dead to sin. He says, I'm not a servant to sin. I'm a servant to him under righteousness and holiness. Well, Gary, does that seem, as I'm puffing away, puffing away, does that seem to square with what you perceive as reality? No, it does not. To me, I'm a slime. I'm a worm. I have no self-discipline. I re, I, I have, I'm, I'm, I'm weak. I can't quit smoking. I can't get... And I, and I'm just... Oh, Jesus talked like that all the time, didn't he? Aren't we supposed to pattern ourselves after him? Amen. Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, you'll never see him in any kind of self-doubt, self-double-minded. I am that I, he's, I and my Father are one. I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by me who convinces me of sin. And on and on and on. You don't ever see him wavering with his mouth regarding the truth of what God says. He says, I only say what God says. When are we going to become his disciples? Take his word, put it like a bit in our mouth. Change the rudder on our ship. Your life does not have to keep going the same way it's been going. You have what you say if you believe it in your heart. When you start off, you're building faith. Faith is coming. I did this for days, weeks, months. It took a long time. I wish I'd have known more about adding fasting. I was doing a lot of praying. But anyway, we didn't quit. We got free. Now there's other things I'm wanting. Other things besides just sin. Now we're wanting, I mean, not, I'm not wanting sin. <laughs> wanting to be free from sin. Now I'm wanting other things that I see in his word that he says about us. Revival things. Anointing things. Power over the enemy things. When are we going to quit wavering at those things? But quit being double-minded and just say what he says. That is the wisdom of God. And if we learn to bridle our tongue, our faith will no longer be vain and useless. We couple this with the other one I did last time. Acknowledging every good thing that is in you in Christ Jesus. And your faith will become effectual. It will become powerful. It will, it will work when anyone fellowships with you. They, they fellowship with your faith and they're going to receive from God what they need. Did you get anything out of that? Hallelujah, hallelujah. 
Now I want to offer you one more verse. One more verse. It's his word. Go to Psalms 141. I want to give you a scripture so you know it's scriptural to do this. Psalms 141. This is a psalm of David. I learned when I was trying to do this, even as I would walk the field and, and for hours and I'd say those verses, still yet I would catch myself without intending to do it when I was, quote, just relaxed and like talking with Sue at home or just talking with friends. I noticed my language would just fall right back into the old pattern until I learned to pray this prayer. And it's verse 3 of this Psalm 141, verse 3. Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth keep the door of my lips did you get that when I started praying that and I said Lord help me would you set a watch on my lips I, I'm having trouble what I noticed then after that he, it's like he would give me a slight hesitation I'm about to blurt out something totally unspiritual <laughs> I'm about to say about myself or about some thing or about somebody something totally opposite but after I learned to pray this prayer Lord help me set a watch on my lips right before I would say it I would get a little hesitation just for a moment and it would give me that opportunity to go whoop nope not going to say that and then I would change and I would say something that agreed with God's word this is a good prayer he will help you he'll if you'll do that right before you're about to say something really stupid <laughs> something totally contrary to what he says There'll be a little hesitation. You'll have a moment to repent. You go, oop, not, I'm not going to say that. I'm going to say, by his stripes I was healed. Or I am free from sin. Or I am born again. Amen.